<laughs> but but and look, well, I must say this one last thing you must hear is that every time a quantum interaction happens or a quantum measurement happens, the whole universe splits into different outcomes. That are so George, like we have number of interpretations and if we if we go this way then it might be a little bit confusing so let's go one by one it's it is going to be very interesting right god does not play with dice one of the most famous einstein yeah. quotes by einstein yeah. and um and that's something we'll be getting into later as well when we look at the interpretations is which play with dice yeah. and which don't you know? so so these are the good things the 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 pros of many worlds interpretation but say that we're actually becoming entangled and there's nothing special or different about measurement to other parts of quantum entanglement. Same accuracy of explanation, but with better, with better physics involved. And I'll quickly just to uh, with better, with better stories I think. Hello everyone, welcome to AD Podcast. And today we have a special episode between scientist Arif Ali and. George Rovell. Scientist Arif Ali is the leading researcher in theoretical physics and he is also leading one of the popular theory, the ancient theory of everything. Also, Arif is the author of the famous book From Newton to Now. On the other side, we have George Rovell from New Zealand. George is a young physics enthusiast. George is a BSc Honours in Physics and he has done graduation diploma in Computer Science and George has done double major bachelors in Applied Mathematics and Mathematical Physics. George handles a famous page Quantum Physics and Cosmology in Facebook and he is also a group expert in different groups. So let's hear an interesting conversation between scientist Arif Ali and George Rovell from New Zealand. Today with us we have George Rovell and we are going to discuss the ins and outs of quantum weirdness and since there are a lot of weird things out there in quantum mechanics from superposition to entanglement from manual interpretation to Copenhagen interpretations there are a lot of things to discuss and yeah. Hello, George. How are you? Hey, thanks so much for having me, Ari. So, yeah, let's get into the thick of it. So, quantum mechanics um, is a very um, bizarre and often quite misunderstood theory by both um, both by um, just people in general these days, but even by the scientists that were studying it themselves when they first when they were first studying it as well. Um, it's a very complex. It's it's quite a uh, it's complex, but more than complicated i would say that it's very abstract and that's what people often find both really sometimes for some people really hard to understand and for other people like myself really sort of <laughs> wondrous for um would be the really the way that i would i would describe it just so almost almost supernatural like and yet and yet still purely science and physics so what, what do you think is the weirdest thing in quantum mechanics? Because there are a lot of things. Let's, if you, I, I ask you to be specific, one thing. Okay. Well, if I really had to be specific about one thing in all of quantum mechanics, that was the most weird. There's so many contenders. But I would probably say that it's the quantum bomb experiment would be the most, the most bizarre. Ah, we, I'm, I'm going to get back to that bomb experiment. So before that, let's, let's talk about the beginning of the, how, how quantum mechanics started. And we all know there's a, there's a huge contribution of two experiments. Like one was the Thomas Young's double seat experiment. And the other was the photoelectric effect of Einstein. So, so yeah, tell us something about the well, certainly double the, um, slit experiment. So yeah. the doubles, the, the first double slit experiments first tested. Um, well, the the most famous experiment in quantum physics with the double slit, slit experiment is, of course, the quantum double slit experiment, where they fire a particle one at a time at a at a, um, a pair of walls, one after the other. The first wall has two slits in it that the particle can travel, yeah. potentially travel through. 
um, to reach another wall behind it, which is a detector wall. So it detects exactly where the particle lands on it when it reaches it. So you've got an electron gun, say, for example, and that's one of the ways that they've done this, one of the amazing ways they've done this experiment is with an electron mm. gun. So let's, let's, let's think about it that way, with firing one electron at a time at, at this first wall and sometime at, um, and um, to reach the, the wall beyond. Now, the bizarre thing here is that what they find in this experiment is instead of what you might expect from classical physics, you might expect the electrons are traveling like little balls, are little balls of sort of electric charge, just like these sort of old pictures before quantum mechanics of what atoms mm -hmm. look like with a little nucleus and you've got a tiny little electron spinning around it, which is a good approximation, but it doesn't really work like that. Uh, it's actually yeah. much more interesting than that, to be honest, as well. Um, much more bizarre. Um, and so you, what you might expect in this experiment is that the electrons will be like these little bo these little balls of charge, as we, we might imagine, we picture them in our imaginations, and they'll just sort of scatter in a random pattern um, when they get go through each of the slits randomly and hit the wall beyond. But what really happens instead is we find, and this feeds into the... Um, the wave particle duality of of, of quantum mm. particles that um, that the that the electrons even though they're going one at a time they don't travel through one slit or the other but they actually travel through both slits not both as a particle yeah. but as a wave or specifically as a quantum wave function now when this when these bits of wave function go through each of the slits and reach the detector wall beyond. At parts of the detector wall where um, where the bits of, where the parts of the wave function cancel each other out, you've got no particles ever arriving at that part of the screen. And at parts yeah. of the detector wall where the pieces of wave function that reach there combine together instead of cancelling, you've got a f high frequency of electrons hitting that part of the detector. And so it forms what's known as a wave interference pattern of these sort of bands of, of on the detector screen of where the electrons hit. And it's totally, um, it's exactly what you would expect of, a, of, of the electron if it existed as a wave while it passed through the slits and not at all what you would expect if it was passing through the slits as a particle in like the old exactly. classical imagination. Now, this, the experimenters, when they first did this, were of course super shocked about this, about electrons acting like waves and passing through both slits at once and combining with itself and cancelling itself out. And they tried, decided to probe this further. And so they tried to test which of the two slits the electron is really passing through to try and trick it. Be yeah. like, well, we, you can't honestly be passing through both slits at once. That's just silly. So let's find out which one it's passing through. And sure enough, they set up this extra detector, not to stop the electron, but just to find out which slit it passes through. And suddenly, when they start doing that, it doesn't pass through both slits as a wave anymore. Now it seems to be more passing through just that one slit at a time as a particle. And it's almost as if once they started watching the electron to see what it was going to do, it stopped acting like a wave. Now, um, the and then finally they thought, well, heck, what happens if we de if the particle gets detected, but we don't, but, but then that information is instantly lost because the particle detector isn't connected to anything? And shockingly, if they unplug the detector from their measurement apparatus for the rest of the experiment, then what happens is when the when the particle is that the particle ignores the detector now and continues to pass through both slits like a wave, just like before they had that second detector. And the <sighs> difference was they just didn't save the data of what the detector was measuring. It's almost as if it's literally our human observation of things. That's what it looks like. It looks like yeah. human observation is what's directly influencing um, particles to stop acting like a wave and what we call yeah. collapse, called a wave collapse function it. collapse. And suddenly, somewhere in its wave function, um, 
it, the particle will suddenly be located, really localized and focused, like an like a like an electron of sort of the old imagination of the tiny ball of charge suddenly. Yeah. Um, and and it seems like now it seems like it's human observation that's the cause of this. It does look that way, and so that's what some of the the physicists that pioneered this theory suspected, which of course put a lot of other physicists like Einstein off. Um, yeah. And but of course, as the theory developed, we have a lot more interpretations being developed, and some of them are really quite ingenious um, at explaining yeah. these results and giving us a deeper. They the, and what what quantum interpretations are is they are a way a theor, are theories of their own that include quantum mechanics, but extended in some way to complete the picture, to give us a deeper understanding of what's going on, more comprehensive and complete. Yeah. Um, because, you know, things suddenly collapsing when we look at them, and then they suddenly sort of teleport from this wave-like structure to suddenly being in some location, which is called, called spooky action at a distance, um, mm. is is all quite, it's called quite un, 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 un not very appealing to a lot of physicists, especially in the early days of pioneering this. And they really um, found it hard to believe, despite all the evidence, that this is how it could really work. Mm, actually, yeah, actually, there are there are number of interpretations. And we know that all the interpretations have some, some blanks to fill. There are, there's little problems in different interpretations in different way. Some are, uh, some are uh, real, but, but doesn't follow the locality principle. Some are local, but they are indeterminate. So, so all the interpretations are lacking somewhere because if we had one interpretations, which fits all together, then we, we would never have this many interpretations, right? right. So, I feel like, I feel like this feeds into a really important concept as well. Um, is what's yeah. called hidden variables theories. And this is what Einstein yeah. was obsessed with and spent a lot of the later yeah. years of his life fruitless, unfortunately fruitlessly researching, unlike his earlier work in, in gravity and quantum mechanics. And uh, so hidden variables theories, is in a, uh, what a hidden variables theory would be if there was such a thing, would be a theory that could explain all the weird and wondrous nature of quantum mechanics. It's probabilistic nature, the sudden spooky yeah. action at a distance with the wave function abruptly collapsing. Um, Entanglement. Yeah. And, and the whole problem of why things suddenly change when we measure them as well. Um, and and yeah. it would try and do this with a coastally, with just like a particle that was always in one place. It was always, it, uh, had one state at all times. So it was always in one place. It's always spinning in one direction, nicely behaved in a classical sense. And also it only interacts with its immediate environment. It can't do things. It can't suddenly move somewhere in a distance abruptly or, or yeah. affect something yeah. at a distance away just without any time for that message to be communicated. Now, this idea yeah. of the ideal solution to quantum mechanics does not exist. And we know this, we don't know this as, a, we basically know this is a definite mathematical fact now, and um, that that's the case. And we get this from experiments like, well, uh, we, which we can maybe get into later on in the cast, um, called the yeah. Bell Test, which try and really get on top of this. Now, interpretations, so other interpretations of quantum mechanics that really do exist, real theories that we have, unlike hidden variables theories, either, they tend to either accept they all, all accept at least one of, uh, they all give up, sorry, they all give up on at least one of locality. One, yeah. That means that, that things can only interfere with what's in their immediate environment. They can't somehow affect. So, so, so George, so George, like we have number of interpretations and if we, if we go this way, then it might be a little bit confusing. So let's go one by one. It's, it is going to be very interesting, right? And before, before that, I, I'd like to tell that there are a lot of people who, who claim that Einstein, he couldn't cope up with the quantum mechanics, right? There, there are people who think like Einstein couldn't understand quantum mechanics, but, but he actually was the one who 
originated who started quantum mechanics he he was even awarded nobel prize for his work in photoelectric effect and that's how he proved the dual nature of light as well light is also a packet of energy that's what he proved and he also had a very interesting statement that god god never play dice and that's where that's where he shows his belief toward the hidden variables right there is a variable which is god does not play with dice one of the most famous einstein yeah. quotes by einstein yeah. and um and that's something we'll be getting into later as well when we look at the interpretations is which play with dice yeah. and which don't you know so which one is as per you the most accepted interpretations of quantum mechanics well it's it's a good <laughs> question it's now i changed my own mind in recent years so i used to lean towards what's called um i always believed for a long time now in quantum realism so there is no actual uh, particle as such the particle exists in a multitude of different simultaneous states in a superposition of possible states that you might measure it in and it's not actually chosen yet before you interact with it this is sort of known as quantum mm. realism um this this whole yeah. notion that wave functions of part of quantum particles aren't just descriptions of of how we can understand what happens in experiments but this but that this really is a fundamental way to understand what's going on uh, and that's yes yeah, so again mm. that's known as quantum realism um and um so two such theories are the objective collapse theory and the objective collapse theory is where um which i used to used to subscribe to um or lean towards shall i say um is that so the wave function really does exist as a wave function until you measure it and then it's almost as if something in the measurement process or at some point uh in the measurement process it's all between all of the quantum inter um, interactions that take place between first detecting a particle me interacting with its wave function and receiving that message as an experimenter on a on a computer um all that all of those interactions from start to finish um that go on there at some point um there's a likelihood that the whole process will just collapse and um the wave function yeah. will cease to exist as a wave function where the particle is doing all sorts of things at the same time and in different locations and suddenly it will choose one or the other of these different states now um and, but I, but the thing is with these theories that say okay yeah so it does exist as a wave function and then at some point um, it's in too many interactions or just too much time cause it to cl abruptly collapse Pro and, and a lot of the theories lean towards too many interactions so because there's a lot of interactions between it's not the first interaction the detector first interacting with a particle but somewhere along the chain of interactions to get that information to you. That the that it seems to that this collapse seems to happen um, now, but so that's that's objective collapse theories. But there's a, a theory that but there's a theory that can do even better than that, um, known as the many worlds interpretation. Now, for a lot of people, ah. so this, this there's a lot of misunderstanding. Just like with quantum mechanics in general, even within the quantum physics community, this. Uh, enthusiasts, I mean, not professional, not experts, of course. Um, amongst enthusiasts, there can be misunderstandings about this theory. Um, and yeah. uh, now, it's 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 even its name, the many worlds theory. Perhaps I that was just thinking today is probably not the wisest choice of of words because uh, of the name. <laughs> yeah, the reason for that is, and I, that's the first thing I want to say about this quantum interpretation, is that it's. One of the most infamous things about it is that people think that every time a quantum interaction happens or a quantum measurement happens, the whole universe splits into different outcomes that it yeah. could have. Right? It's, that the wave so, function so collapses wrong. and then it collapses into all possible states. And these all correspond to different universes, but no, no, it's not quite no, it's no, not no, as no, ridiculous no. as that. The whole universe uh, doesn't split. First let me First, let me tell what, what I uh, I have understood about many world interpretations. It's like uh, the, the, there is already the existence of multiple states. There there are already a number of universes. And at the time of measurement, at the time of measurement, 
those states get gets like disentangled and and it happens differently in two different universes that's how i i have been i have been like like perceiving the manivol interpretation so so like yeah it's close and it does it does work like it's 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 very a very accurate but for one detail is that it's not the whole world, it's not the whole universe that splits when these splits happen, but actually it's only for the particles directly involved in the measurement. So for the rest of the universe that hasn't had a chance to interact with you with the, you and the experiment yet, so let's just say you've just, the, the wave function's just collapsed um, and you've, you've just measured the particle and seen where it is. Now, for the rest of the universe, like so, quite some distance away that hasn't had time to interact with you yet, um, uh, there's no collapse. In, um, it's relative to the rest of the universe. It's just two systems of wave functions, two quantum systems, the experimenter and the, and the, and the measuring device, and the and the and the me, the particle that they're measuring that these things have become quantum entangled with each other, but for the rest of, and that's what's happened relative to the rest of the universe is these things have only become entangled. The whole universe hasn't split. They've merely gone from being separate quantum entities to entangled ones. But within yeah. but within the reality encoded with. In those entangled wave functions, that is where the the whole universe appears to split, um, and it's really just the particles. But it's really just the particles directly involved in the interaction for which these split into separate realities of different outcomes for the experiments. You know, um, and so you kind of have this, um, yeah. So that's that's a the good thing the good thing about uh, the the advantage of m accepting like many world interpretation is that uh, the best thing is that it's real right <laughs> the best thing is real it it is it is local as well it 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 has no problem with the speed of light and it doesn't require any hidden variables so so these are the good things the 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 pros of many worlds interpretation but on the other hand i think like I, I always think of Occam's razor, you know, when when it comes to manual interpretation, because we we can't do an experiment to prove that there there's there's a universe existing right beside you or somewhere here, and we are not able to detect it. We will never be able to detect that, right? So these are a kind of drawback for manual interpretation. Brilliant. This is the biggest drawback. The one big drawback that I do confess for the many worlds interpretation, which I lean towards personally in recent years, is that um, indeed uh, one of those points was totally legit and one of those points is a really good, is a, is a really com common misconception amongst physics enthusiasts that it's, again, that it's the whole universe that's that's splitting in this cope and the um and the yeah. Occam's razor. Occam's razor does play a role with many worlds interpretation, but it's not what you yeah. think. And wait for that. So, um, in the in the, in the many worlds interpretation. So when two particles uh, interact, the many world says that if you if you are if if, if say two say two systems of particles. So my body and and one electron. Right, so all the particles in my body, and then that's one system, and you've got a separate system. It's just one electron. So when I measure that electron, interact with it, what have you, um, the particles that make up me in some detector, and I measure that particle, me and the detector become the many worlds. The interpretation claims, um, explains, should we say, that we're actually becoming entangled, and there's nothing special or different about measurement to other parts of quantum entanglement. That it's just quantum. Mm. It's just what quantum entanglement feels like from the inside of the experience. So, kind of like, as one of the particles directly involved in the measurement, it's actually uh, it seems like a wave function collapse. But for particles outside of that direct interaction that haven't interacted with the system yet, it looks just like quantum entanglement and nothing more than that, and no collapse occurred at all. And this is actually, this idea is really powerful because that is totally consistent with experiment. If it seems mm, as if, yeah. if we're not, if we're not watching 
the wave function doesn't collapse. So again, it's not just because we detect something in the first place that, that, that it hit the detector screen or what have you that, that things collapse. It has to be something more complicated than that because when we unplug yeah. those devices, it stops working, you know? Yeah, that, that, that is too weird, like boom, you know? Now, with, now <laughs> this is really important here is with Occam's razor and the many worlds interpretation, a massive, misun yeah. a massive misunderstanding is that Occam's razor dismisses the many worlds interpretation for being ridiculously yeah. complicated because there's all these different w universes splitting into existence. But it's really important here yeah. that it's only when I make a, when me and my detector device make a measurement, the worlds, it's only me, the detector, and the electron I'm measuring that split. So if I try and measure an electron spin, which way is the electron spinning? And it's in a superposition, so it's spinning one way and the other way at the same time. When I measure that, according to the many worlds interpretation, nothing actually collapses, but I, but when you entangle with it, um, this basically, this means that from your experience, the, the universe is, the way that you experience this from within the entangled system of wave functions is that the world splits and that, so not the world splits, but the experiment splits. So you, the detector, and the electron split into two versions. One you detector and electron that was that detected electron spin left, and one you detector electron that measured the electron spinning right instead. And so this is what split. It's everything involved in the experiment that split but not everything else beyond the experiment. And so this is the first really great misconception about many worlds to clear up, is that, it, is that it's just the experiment, what's involved directly in the experiment that gets split into multiple realities and not everything else in existence in the universe. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise it, would, it would be like, it is so, so difficult to think, like we are talking about an electron, electron and it is multiple states. Just imagine like, how many electrons we have here? <laughs> How many worlds are going to split? I mean, let's let's so not forget though. Let's not let's not. Um, I will stress though, and another weakness of the many worlds is that while it's not true that the whole universe splits each time, as I've just explained, but there are a lot of these interactions going on, and so there is a huge amount of splitting going on. There is a, it does yeah. result in an absurd number of individual realities, but not technically in, but. But um, a large number of realities, but at least it's not, but it certainly isn't the whole universe that splits. Just that, just that when things become entangled, for, for those things that are entangling, it's as if the, the world split. Just for those things that are directly involved in it, though. Um, and um, I'll, I'll quickly say that... Um, so so this this is about many words interpretation right so right yes uh there, there is there is an interpretation which has been like widely taught we can't say like widely accepted there are a lot of people who are strictly against it and that is copenhagen interpretation right so the copenhagen interpretation was kind of like the original uh original solution suggested solution for quantum mechanics and and, and many people argued that it was not very good. Um, it was extremely abstract, and it had spooky action at a distance, and it also had yeah. uh, it had neither it had neither locality. It had spooky action at a distance, and it also this theory also has non-realism. So particles don't have an exact state until you measure yeah. them, and then <laughs> things can abruptly change in non-local spooky action at a distance ways when you do measure them as well yeah. um yeah. and I, in Cop but but to those copenhagen it's the actual measurement itself the actual perception the observation that they claim is is collapsing the wave function now it does it often does look like that it, it really can look like that but arguably other interpretations like the many worlds um Provide the same accuracy of explanation, but with better, with better physics involved. And I'll quickly just to quick with better stories, I think. I'll, like same reason, yeah. I'll quickly say to finish on the many worlds is that, um, so so the many worlds in particular, it's most, um, firstly just just to finish on 
Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor actually says that the many worlds interpretation is the most mathematically simple uh, um, solution to quantum mechanics. Now, this is very counterintuitive. Mm. How on earth could it be that mathematically the simplest thing is all these splitting realities? And sure, it's only like the local experiments and, and interactions that are splitting, but it's still a lot of splitting. It's still pretty abstract. Um, yeah, yeah. That this is the most simple explanation. The explanation for that is that <clears throat> you see, we already have what we have for sure is that the wave function seems to be the best and most accurate way to describe quantum particles up until measurement. And many worlds just says, hey, wait a minute, what if we're just misunderstanding what happens when we make a measurement and there is no collapse? It's just the internal experience, the subjective experience of of what it's like when you entangle with something that you're measuring. Yeah. And, and in this way, they actually removed the whole collapse postulate. So in this, in many worlds, wave function collapse is just an illusion that covers for, that covers from the reality of quantum entanglement. Um, and so mm. that you, what you have in many worlds is that, the, is that the Schrodinger equation that describes how the wave function moves is the end of the yeah. story that is the full picture of quantum mechanics according to the many worlds interpretation and so because everything in quantum mechanics can be explained with the least maths via many worlds interpretation this therefore makes it the mathematically simplest interpretation and therefore by it by occam's razor the simplest answer shockingly yeah and so oh uh, that that's yeah. Yeah, that, that that might be a like huge statement as well, because because I I personally feel sometimes I feel like you know weak Copenhagen interpretation is so simple <laughs> in a way that it it doesn't talk about anything it 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 tells you set up and calculate it gives you formulas it it makes predictions and very accurate predictions as well but it doesn't talk about what is wave function what it talks about where in the world this waving is happening right so in some way we can call it a, a very simple as well yeah well that's a good point but the difference between copenhagen <laughs> and many worlds is that and this is the they are identical up until wave function collapse and the the Benny world says there's no wave function collapse. Schrodinger, do your thing. Yeah. While Schrodinger equation, do your thing. While Copenhagen says, oh, that's the yeah. end of the game, collapsed. Um, and it's now <laughs> sort of transitioned non-locally by spooky action yeah. at a distance to a, a yeah. particle. And so you see, yeah. many worlds doesn't have that complication, that extra that extra piece to explain. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting that you, you, are, you are not going to agree, right? <laughs> But, but and well, I must say this one last thing you must hear is that many worlds yeah. on top of all of this is one of the only interpretations yeah. that is completely local in that actually yeah. it explains yeah. all spooky action at a distance as purely an illusion. And it also yeah. explains all probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics as purely kind of an illusion as well the probabilities just come from not knowing which of the worlds you'll split into and so that's where the probabilities yeah. come from and so you've got with many worlds yeah. you've got it explains locality not everything's local it's just a trick of the it's just a trick it's just an illusion don't worry about it there's no broken physics yeah. here uh, there's non no local there's non no lo non local spooky action at a distance in the actual physics just what you think you see then it's got um the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics is completely explained in an yeah. entirely deterministic, mathematically exact way. Um, and and so, yeah, I think because of these two, because of these two principles especially, um, and another thing is the, the, is the many worlds interpretation also provides its own derivation of the Born rule. The Born rule is one of the founding principles of quantum yeah. mechanics. And it's just, Bourne didn't really prove it. He just sort of saw that this would work, right? Mathematically speaking. Yeah. Uh, um, and we won't go into details, but the, what the, the Bourne rule basically in a nutshell is how you connect a wave function 
to the likelihood of an experimental outcome. And it's not really... Yeah. Um, and and so many worlds explains that, oh, well, it's simple, you see, with all these different worlds and how that sort of unfolds when the universe splits, you get the Born Rule. And sure enough, it, it, mm. it can be shown that it predicts this. So you've got the Born Rule, totally local, no spoky action at a distance. You've got... Um, and you've got resolving that inherent, explaining away yeah. that inherent probabilistic yeah. nature. No more playing with dice. You know, that's only, that's another yeah. part of the trick that it's exposed. <laughs> uh, Actually, there's a there's one more interpretation, like uh, it's called, uh, yeah, quantum ensemble interpretation. It tells that particles are not actually one, like a single entity. It's it's uh, uh, an ensemble of entity and that's, that's how it try, tries to sort out the locality problem and and it's interesting and one more have you you've probably heard about the pilot wave theory of course the, pilot the, wave the, theory yeah. pilot wave theory is close it's almost like a hidden variables theory but not quite so it's almost yeah. what einstein was hoping for einstein was hoping for a well behaved particle it's always doing one thing in one place at a time and it doesn't jump all over the place. It moves from place to yeah. place rather than spooky action at a distance. Um, now, you, now, pilot wave theory is close. It, it does away, it, it says, no, well, we couldn't, we couldn't help you out, Einstein, on pilot wave says, we couldn't help you out on the spooky action at a distance. Sorry about that. But we'll give, mm. we will give you a particle that's in one place at one time, you know, and... At least, at least realistic. Yeah, so at least it would be real yeah. in the sense. It would have this realness yeah. to it. So let's, when I say real for the context of quantum mechanics, what I literally mean here in this context is particles always have one state at once. They can only spin in one direction yeah. at once. They can only be in one place at once. That's called real. So yeah. quantum yeah. realism is a, instead is, that, is the opposite of that, and that's saying, nah, the particles really are in superposition. They're spinning both ways at once, and they're in multiple places at once as well. Get over it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so you've got these two. So um, the pilot wave theory attempts to describe how you've got these two interacting systems. You've got what's called the pilot wave, and you've got which is like shaped like the wave function of the particle, and it pushes the little particle along, and that's why it only moves where the wave function is. It's kind of being pushed along by the wave function. Now, the problem with this theory yeah. is, firstly, it does assume spooky action at a distance. So the, the bits of the wave function, yeah. if you detect a bit of the pilot wave, the particle will instantly know. And that's sort of at a bit of an absurd part of this theory. Now, the other major problem with this yeah. theory is that it can't be combined with Einstein's special relativity. Unlike um, other, unlike the many worlds interpretation, and actually most of the interpretations, pilot wave has been left behind. Yeah, so like uh, like you said that many worlds interpretation f fits somehow with uh, general relativity uh, better than other interpretations. But which interpretations? I feel like many many world interpretation fits properly with general relativity, Einstein's relativity, right? Did you say that? Actually, let me let me think about that for a sec. About with now, that's another question. Is uh, there's two factors here, right? You've got well, more than two factors, but two two main uh, bags of factors, right? You've got you've got um, what we just discussed before about uh, you know things like the, the explaining things that seem to demand explanation, like non-local action, spooky action at a distance. That is. Yeah. Um, the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics when you make a measurement result. Um, and yeah, th those really, and of course, you know, the measurement problem, why is measurement significant? And so those are, are, th are three main things. There's other things too, like the Born rule, which only some of them supply. Yeah. But then again, locality yeah. is only supplied by some of them as well. Um, some um, mm. And um, yeah, so general relativity, that's, that's the pretty... other factor. Yeah. Many worlds, um, many worlds doesn't, as it stands at the moment, actually fit with general relativity, and that would be a massive detracting point against it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and yeah. when I say it doesn't fit, it well, it, it depends on which regard we're talking about. Um, in terms yeah. of 
Um, gravity. Gravity is a problem for many worlds interpretation. Now, yeah. but there's a but of course now what we'll discuss hopefully at the end when we have if we have time is that I've actually developed my own mathematical theory to extend quantum mechanics to provide this link between um, to, to allow this link between theories such as uh, objective collapse yeah. theories and also yeah, it, many worlds interpretation and general relativity in this regard of okay, gravity. Okay. Yeah. So it, that's the, that's we are going to talk about that. We are going to talk about that, but before that, uh, th there's a lot of problems with uh, with like bringing together relativity and quantum mechanics, right? There's like it's a huge problem in in current physics world. It's it's a kind of we've got to leave everything apart, leave aside, and just work on that because these are the two main pillars of modern physics, and uh, general relativity explains things based on space time which can be curved which can be distorted right but when it comes to quantum mechanics it it talks about the smooth space and time it talks about the flat space and time right well yes so, this is this is a real and actually yeah. another really important thing to inject here is that um is, is with regards to gravity and, and general relativity is that some quantum mm. theorists hope that they will come up with a particle theory uh, of of gravity, so a graviton, just like we've got photons that transmit sort of light energy, um, they would hope that there would be a graviton that would transmit gravitational attraction um, between uh, between yeah. objects. They haven't found this. They haven't managed to theorize it. Though. Yeah. So that's not a yeah. it's not a thing. Um, they hope to make one up, but they they haven't found they haven't managed to make it yeah. mathematically viable yet to find a particle. And so what this conclude, what I conclude about this is that general relativity actually is correct and that um, that qu quantum mechanics at its assumption of a flat space time is it's a very old assumption now and I think it's one that needs to be to be dropped. But the reason that they can't just drop it and just say, okay, fine, curve space time is because, the way space-time curves, that's all to do with gravity. And they don't know how mm. to connect the quantum physics of the, the quantum the quantum sort of um, non non-realism of quantum mechanics, how things exist in superposition yeah. and connects yeah, that it's... to an exact curvature for space-time, you see. When you've got objects in superposition, it becomes mathematically impossible to describe yeah. the space-time curvature because of that. And that's a huge problem yeah. for quantum mechanics. And this is, the but this is the greatest ever clash between quantum mechanics and general yeah. relativity, the greatest of all of them. And, and we know that whenever there's a clash, there is a very beautiful thing that, that grows in there, you know, like uh, there, there is a time when, when there is a class between Maxwell and Newton. There is a time when we got special relativity, and then there is problem with uh, with the the like you know instantaneous gravity effect, and then we got general relativity, and again now we are at the same point where where we have two very big theories, and they are not getting together. And I think it, it is going to give rise to something very beautiful and it might even like destroy our current understanding because we... I think that two we, things, we, I think there's two things that really just cannot go anywhere and that's at least special relativity. You see, all of uh, modern, you see, we've already tested, we've, we, all we have managed to do is combine yeah. quantum mechanics with special relativity. That cuts out pilot wave, unfortunately, but the but everyone else comes for the right. He missed the bus, you know? <laughs> yeah. But but everyone but, but all but the other interpretation but, yeah, in in my previous discussion with uh, Dr. Heike Belek, we, we discussed some of the some of the theories, uh, so called the ancient theories that, that are trying to Come, come in the focus. They are, they are trying to explain things that uh, even relativity is struggling to explain. Like uh, we, we even had a discussion where we talked about the second postulate of special relativity, the the invariable constancy of speed of light, and 
and uh, we we like uh, reached to the conclusion that we don't have any experiments till date that that confirms the second postulate directly like there are, there are many indirect evidences there are a lot of evidences that proves time dilation that that proves gravitational lensing which are the product of relativity but not directly the second postulate where we tell that the speed of light is constant uh, in all frame of reference and till now we are not even able to measure the one way speed of light so i think that there's still a room there's still a space that we can come up with a a very different a very original concept that can bring quantum mechanics and relativity together so what's your take on that well i think that for a start we're going to look what why do we think that so um why think that things like relativity are true so so what is like the crux of relativity we've talked a lot about quantum mechanics let's quickly let's quickly talk about relativity because it's a it's an equally yeah. bizarre and interesting theory and also 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 i would like you to connect this with your concept like you you have developed a very beautiful concept trying to bring them together please please talk about that as well yeah so in relativity what you have is that well just go through some of the simple parts of it the more, the, the easier parts of it is that einstein realized you know when we said the speed of light was constant and they're all like well constant relative to what is there some like backdrop still exactly great stillness and everything's sort of moving relative to that you know this was a really great intuitive guess it's i mean it's it's how the world looks like it works it kind of looks like everything's moving so. relative to some big stationary backdrop right now relativity suggested yeah. what if that's not actually true because they've never managed to detect any proof they tried but they could never find any proof of any difference in the laws of physics depending on like say if they guessed some stationary backdrop frame and like okay well what if we're going against it or with it and no, nothing made any mm. difference and that was the weird thing and and then that, then Einstein realized and it's 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 thought experiments like this right if everything had to travel at the speed of light no matter what all no exceptions if you're moving in a if you're if if um so if, if 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 you're moving at a constant speed you must see light travel at the speed of light that's what i meant to say sorry and so um, yeah now here's a problem with that okay let's say i'm on a train in a, in, a, in the future very distant future and it's moving at half the speed of light okay and now i'm going to mm -hmm. shine mm -hmm. a torch forward um in the same direction the train is moving i'm i'm sitting on the train and I'm shining a torch forward. Now, I see the light move at exactly the speed of mm. light relative to me moving on the half light speed train, right? Now, but if someone was looking in through the window um, and could see this light be moving along and they weren't on the light speed train, the half light speed train, how fast would they see it moving? Now, I've said that for me, it's the speed, the speed of light, right? So, but I'm moving on a train that's moving at half the speed of light. So if you do the math there, a Newtonian idea of how the world would work would say that the person mm. next to the train would see the light beam inside the train moving at one and a half times the speed of light. Train oh, speed, speed light, yeah. plus light speed. Wrong. Mm. They see it also, just like me, at exactly the speed of light even Speed though yeah. that paints a seemingly inconsistent picture of reality. And the answer is that Einstein realized, and it's kind of ingenious in that it's, it makes me laugh in that like it's so abstract and yet the maths is actually surprisingly straightforward for special relativity. And that's yeah. part of the genius yeah. of it, is that general relativity is very mathematically complex, his later work, but this early work, working out time dilation, the algebra is simple enough to probably show a fifth former at high school. So it's like, it's, yeah. uh, which is really astounding that something that breakthrough could be that, could have been that mathematically simple. <laughs> but the, but, the, but, the, but it, that's the beauty sometimes of physics. It's not about being the best mathematician always. It's also about having the most creative insights as well. And that's what really yeah. went through here. You know? Now, what mm. Einstein realized is that time and space actually swap at high speeds and that 
um, this is part of his special relativity, and that that at high at the half light speed on the half light speed train, my whole experience of time is slowed down relative to someone next to the train because of my high speed, and and so and and my space will also seem kind of compressed in some way or, or stretched, and the, the combination of the stretching of space and the stretching and squeezing of time. So making time more compact or stretching it to make it stretched out and slower. This combined effect means that everyone can see the speed of light at the same speed, no matter how fast that train is going. Even if it went 99% the speed of light. Let's change the scenario now. I'm going at 99% of the speed of light on the train. I shine the light forward. I still see it at the speed of light relative to me. But the guy next to the train, again, by a Newtonian idea, you'd expect him to see it at almost two times the speed of light. But instead, he sees it at half that speed. And so that's, and that, of course, this is the same explanation. It's the same stretching and warping of space and time that make the numbers crunch out to, to keep the speed of light yeah. always the same. Now, we know that this is, we, we, I mean, this is actually taken into consideration by how our GPSs work, right? So that's a really yeah. amazing thing is that our GPS is, um, is that not, not by a large factor, but they're, but because of the differences in gravity and speed that they experience um, where they are in orbit, traveling at high speeds around the Earth and, um, and with slightly less gravity being further away than the surface, the combined effect of that is that they actually have a slightly slowed down time, experience of time relative yeah. to us. And if we didn't take that into consideration, over time, G GPSs would fail uh, because there would be yeah. like a miscommunication. If you assume that the speed of that that um, that there is no relativity, um, that GPSs would not be able to function. You know, they would they would just lose yeah, exactly. accuracy constantly and have to constantly be reset all the time. You know? um, yeah. So whenever we yeah, whenever we talk about relativity, we, we, we don't get tired, like thanking Einstein, thank you so much, thank you so much. But we, we forget a name like Hendrik Lorenz, who, who formulated this transformation. And that's what was, was brought up with a very beautiful concept by Einstein, right? So, so now t tell me a little about what, what you have to like, you know, present. Oh, of course. So my theory, what, what, right. so yeah, please. Let's let's. So this is the, uh, the the dessert, I guess, for today. Is that um, now? So I've developed my own theory. Well, one of my uh, mathematical theories in, in quantum physics is uh, my favorite yeah. one is called quantum mass wave theory. Now, uh, which is and it's it's designed to be a mathematical bridge between quantum mechanics and general relativity. Now. It's not supposed to. Comp it's not. No, it does not fix particular thing problems that are inherent to relativity itself, like black hole singularities, and that's a discussion for another time. But, um, but what it does do is, yeah. wherever relativity works, it should help merge quantum mechanics in with it, basically. And so, um, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a mathematical bridge between them. But it's really, it's a quantum theory, but it's in a, a sort of a, a cleverly s simple quantum theory in that it allows, uh, it's consistent with quantum mechanics while also allowing this com combination between the two by, by a really intriguingly simple trick um, that um, strangely, I, I don't know why, you know, people haven't noticed it before, this trick, but, uh, but, um, but basically, um, so, so we've got that, like, so in my theory, we first assume that, um, that qu all of quantum mechanics, as it stands, is, is all verified and, and true. And we also assume that general relativity is also the, go the, is, is also the governing fundamental equations for how gravity works and space, time and yeah. space and time bend, right? So we assume both of these mm. things. Now, immediately this causes a problem, and it's exactly what the theory is supposed to fix. Is the immediate problem is that well, wait a minute, you just can't have particles. You just can't have that the mass of objects right exists as a wave function, like not really determined where mm -hmm. it is. It's kind of here, kind of there. It hasn't decided, mm -hmm. and and still have an exact 
curvature for space time. Because you see, if there was if the particle's mass is not quite one place or another, then the curvature isn't quite one place or another either. And that's a huge problem. And it, that it just it, yeah. there's just no way to make that the maths work out. It's called an, a normalization problem. You cannot renormalize it. Infin it all blows up to infinity yeah. and there's no way around it. Now this theory would fix that. And that is that it says, well, wait a minute. Um, in, in quantum mechanics, what is it that only some properties are actually in superposition? So position and momentum and spin, these are all properties in superposition. But what is not in superposition, for example, is the electric charge of the, of the, prop, of the particle. The electric charge mm. is actually exists not in superposition, but actually like the wave function, where the wave function spread out. It's not that the charge hasn't worked out where it is. It really is spread like this. It's just literally uh, spread yeah. in that pattern. So it's not that it's in one. It's not that it hasn't decided where it is. It literally is spread out like a blob, like the wave function. Now this is quite confusing. How can some properties exist as real properties, and other properties exist mm. as like a not decided yet? It's it is counterintuitive. Uh. But this is proved by Dirac in the first place that electric charge works like this. And so what I've suggested, and now so firstly you'll notice that. There is no uncertainty principle for electric charge. Where charge is has no uncertainty in it, according to quantum mechanics. No mm. fundamental, yeah. like, guaranteed uncertainty. And so this means that it can't actually exist. So it must be true, what Dirac said, that it exists as a real wave rather than a superposition wave, because electric charge, because... Um, there's no otherwise it would need to have an uncertainty relationship to describe how it can't all be in one place at once. It, it's it's sort of it hasn't decided yet, but it, we're saying it has decided and it exists in the same shape as the wave function, but as a, like a literally as a blob of, of and spread out in this way, more in a classical sense than actually in a quantum sense, surprisingly. Um, and but then so then if mass if mass also follows this pattern. Now remember, mass, quantum mass, does not have any uncertainty relationship to it, right? And no, so, no, no. Yeah. arguably, therefore, mass also should not actually exist in superposition unless there's an undiscovered Heisenberg uncertainty principle relating to mass, but we have never discovered one. Mm -hmm. The theorists have never come no, up with one. Not yet. And so, not what yet. I, I propose, well, what if it's not in superposition at all? What if it's like a real wave just like the electric charge, instead of a superposition yeah. wave like momentum, spin, and and position, and so you have these, you can have these dual descriptions. And the proof of concept, luckily for me, is that is Dirac's proof that this works for electric charge. Um, there's oh, a sort of nice little demo project there to show that the idea can work. <laughs> um, and uh, that's so unique. Yeah. Um, uh, uni yeah. And so, um, and the idea is literally, so you literally have the Born rule. The Born rule becomes, describes, would, would describe both um, the electric charge. The Born rule describes the electric charge as a real wave. It describes the position of the particle as a superposition mm -hmm. of where the particle might be. And I would propose that a third notion to add to this, that the particle also exists as a real wave of mass. And now, of course, okay. these real waves of electric charge, the known one, in my suggestion, mass, they, of course, collapse with the wave function upon measurement. So they don't stay spread out like this. That is only how their properties are positioned until interaction. And then from the position, from the perspective of measurement, everything collapses along with the wave function. It all collapses together. They're all part, they all, all of these distributions, the real, the real electric charge distribution, the position superposition, the location superposition of the particle, and my proposed mass wave, they're all exactly on top of each other. Um, so we already know the first two of these are true, and I'm suggesting that there's this third wave that's on top of those as well, the mass wave. That, that's, so, that's so great, George. Like, uh, a youngster like you working on such a global target, you know, it's a, it's a global objective. We want to sort this out, right? 
and it's so great you to see you working so so passionately on this and and yeah talking about the counterintuitive nature of the the quantum world it's let's accept it let's accept it because it's we are always used it. to some of the it's beautiful yeah. it's weird but it's yeah. wondrous and it's beautiful as well it's beautiful yeah it's weird yeah, it's, it's great just way. because it's weird like your favorite abstract <laughs> art piece there you go that's a great yeah yeah it's just because this ape mind is not being able to like uh, like understand it properly or easily we can't say that it's weird it's not even weird it's beautiful i think and yeah so i i, I wish you lots and lots and lots of luck fortune and everything that that comes through your journey like you are you are doing a really a great job and and i know there are a lot of things incomplete like we have a, a, we we could even spend the whole day talking this way but uh, week, it's but time time, time constraints yeah of course we could go uh, we I, could go forever uh, we should spare we should give your poor viewers a break i think you know <laughs> yeah um, to my viewers i'm i'm very very sorry to make it this short and 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 like this discussion might not come to an end if we forget about the camera <laughs> right so george it's it was it was really wonderful talking to you and i'm sure that we are going to get a lot of comments for the part 2 of this discussion and we'll certainly do it and we'll we'll try to cover a whole episode on the new concepts of quantum mechanics that has been rising to, like all around the globe right there are a lot of beautiful interpretations and the most beautiful that i have come through recently is the quantum ensemble interpretation i'm literally in love with that and i'm working on that and we'll discuss about that as well in the next podcast so in me your work on an ra and i'd so love to read it that would be fantastic yeah, yeah. yeah to most of our viewers are like a lot of our viewers are from nepal and uh, Oh, what do you have to say to my Nepali audience? See you on the Nepali audience. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your uh, attention and um and and hearing me out. And um yeah. and please, I hope that this opens your eyes just a little bit more towards the mysterious wonders of the quantum weirdness of our quantum relativistic universe yeah. thank you so much thank you so much for having yeah. me on the show ari yeah th thank you so much george for your time and for everything that you have given to us today and let's hope for part 2 of this discussion so thank you so much george it is great talking to you see you soon ari